Next, a general accounting office study on the readiness of government agencies to operate in the event of a natural disaster or terrorist attack. Also participating at this hearing, an official from the Homeland Security Department. This is about an hour and 20 minutes. Good morning. A quorum being present, the Committee on Government Reform will come to order. I would like to welcome everyone to today's hearing on the status of Federal Government's Continuity of Operations Plans. Today on the House floor, we are considering legislation laying out the framework for how Congress would continue operating in the event of a catastrophe. That is important. But let's be honest. The real, tangible day-to-day -day work of the Federal Government doesn't happen here. It happens at agencies spread across the nation, and ensuring their continued operation in the wake of a devastating tragedy should be considered every bit as important. Continuity of Federal Government operations planning became essential during the Cold War to protect the continuity of government in the event of a nuclear attack. Co-op planning has attracted renewed significance after the terrorist uh, attacks of September 11. Through a Presidential Decision Directive and a Federal Preparedness Circular, Federal agencies are required to develop viable uh, continuity of operations plans for ensuring the continuity of essential operations in emergency situations. Although it is a classified document, PDD 67 reportedly also designates the Federal Emergency Management Association, FEMA, as the executive agency for formulating guidance on executive departments' uh, co-op plans and coordinating and assessing their capabilities. In July of 1999, FEMA issued Federal Preparedness Circular 65, FPC 65, which confirms its coordinating uh, agency role contains criteria for agencies to develop their plans and designates timelines for submission uh, of agency plans. Because of the critical nature of the ongoing threat of emergencies, including terrorist attacks, severe weather, and individual building emergencies, this committee requested the GAO to evaluate contingency plans of several Federal agencies and review FEMA's oversight of those agencies' co-op plans. In February uh, 2004, GAO issued a report that found a wide variance of essential functions identified by individual agencies. GAO attributed this lack of uniformity to several factors. Lack of specificity of a criteria to identify essential functions uh, in FPC 65. Lack of review by FEMA of essential functions during assessment of co-op planning lack of testing uh, or exercises by FEMA to confirm the identification of essential functions by agencies. To remedy these shortcomings, GAO recommends that the Secretary of uh, Department of Homeland Security direct the Under Secretary for Emergency Preparedness and Response to ensure that agencies develop co-op plans by May 1, 2004 and correct deficiency in individual plans. In addition, GAO recommends that the Under Secretary be directed to conduct assessments of co-op plans that include independent verification of agency information agencies, essential functions and their interdependencies with other activities. The Committee is concerned about the seeming lack of progress we have made uh, in the area of Federal continuity of operations. If 9-11 was the wake-up call, then we haven't fully heeded the message when it comes to our planning. Although some progress has been made, and I commend Under Secretary Brown for his leadership on this, we still have a ways to go. We must do everything possible to address the co-op inconsistencies that exist across the board. Identifying and prioritizing essential functions with 100 percent compliance and accuracy is a must. Even if agencies can accomplish this, they still must be able to identify their key staffing requirements, lines of succession, resources needed, and what mis mission critical systems and data must be protected and in many cases be redundant. Continuity of operations means more than keeping your website up and running. What is really called for is a holistic approach, one that factors in people, places and things. What is really needed is agility, because FEMA's role in co-op oversight is key for agency success. The Committee will hear FEMA's assessment of the individual agency's plans. The Committee will also assess FEMA's efforts to ensure that the co-op directives are carried out by each agency. This will include steps FEMA is taking to assess each of the executive agency's co-op plans, what interaction FEMA has had and plans to have with those agencies about deficiencies in those plans, what steps FEMA will take to ensure agency compliance, 
and FEMA's assessment of the adequacy of Federal Preparedness Circular 65 and steps it is taking to overcome any deficiencies. The Committee will also hear from GAO about its assessment of co-op planning and its recommendations for improvement and will also hear how the private sector deals with this issue. Finally, the Committee has asked GAO to continue to monitor Federal co-op planning to ensure that agencies are in compliance with the latest executive and congressional guidance. The Committee expects to get an annual scorecard from GAO outlining how agencies are performing with regard to the many facets of co-op. This is an important issue and will be very aggressive on our oversight. We have three impressive witnesses before us to help us understand the current and the future state of Federal continuity of operations planning the expected problems and what we can look forward to in ways of improvement. First, we will hear from the General Accounting Office, followed by the Department of Homeland Security, and finally, we will hear from AT&T, which has a mature co-op plan in place. I want to thank all of our witnesses for appearing before the Committee, and I look forward to hearing their testimony. Are there any other uh, members who will wish to make opening statements at this point? Ms. Watson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in the event of a crisis, the American people immediately turn to the Federal Government to provide basic services, stability and direction. But we now have learned from the GAO that many Federal agencies are woefully unprepared to continuing functioning in the wake of a catastrophe. It is distressing to know that in the wake of an attack on America, the horror of the initial attack might be compounded by the mayhem of a government that cannot coordinate basic services. We need to get this fixed. And I think all of us have it indelible in our minds where we were and what we were doing on 9-11, myself included, right here in this Capitol. And we knew not where to go. We were running around like ants all over the place. We knew not where to gather. I had to seek out directions, and we have to be sure that we have these plans in place. But this is only the tip of the iceberg. Even beyond this, what is not addressed in this report or in this hearing is continuity of operations at the State or at the local level. I bring this issue up, Mr. Chairman, not to confuse the issue in this hearing, which I understand focuses solely on the continuity of operations and planning in the Federal exe uh, Executive Branch, but rather simply to illustrate the scope of the problem that we face. Even once we get this problem sorted out at the Federal level, we must ensure our States and our local governments that they are prepared. Here we sit two and a half years after facing the mortal threat of 9-11, and we still cannot be assured that we are prepared to provide essential government services in the wake of a disaster. My colleagues and I want some answers, and I ask the witnesses from FEMA, please tell us what you need to tell us, and we will do our best to see that you get it. But we need to hear from you, and we need to know what your plans are for real progress and real answers, and on how you prepare to fix it. And I'm sure you'll find this Congress very supportive. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any other members wish to make opening statements? If not, we'll move to our first witness, Linda Kuntz, the Director of Information Management Issues of the General Accounting Office, no stranger to this committee. As you know, it's a policy of the committee that all witnesses be sworn in um, before they testify. So, Linda, if you'd rise with me and raise your right hand. Um, you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Okay, thank you. For the record, no, we have uh, you, two of your uh, aides behind you uh, also sworn in. Um, <clears throat> please proceed with your testimony. You know the rules. We have uh, uh, the buttons and the, the lights out here with five minutes and try to sum up. And thank you for being with us again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to participate in the committee's hearing on federal continuity of operations planning. As you know, events such as terrorist attacks, severe weather, or building level emergencies can disrupt the delivery of essential government services. 
To minimize the risk of disruption, federal agencies are required to develop plans for ensuring the continuity of essential services in emergency situations. This The Federal Emergency Management Agency, now part of the Department of Homeland Security, was designated executive agents for continuity of operations planning and issued guidance in July 1999. This guidance states that in order to have a viable continuity of operations capability, agencies should identify their essential functions. Identifying essential functions is the first of eight elements of a viable capability and provides the basis for subsequent planning steps. Mr. Chairman, at your request, we assessed department and agency level continuity of operation plans at 23 major federal agencies and reported the results to you in February. In summary, we found that first, three departments did not have plans in place as of October 1, 2002. Second, our assessment raised serious questions about the adequacy of the essential functions identified. Specifically, we found that 29 of the 34 plans that we reviewed identified at least one essential function. However, these functions varied widely in number from 3 to 399 and included many that appeared to be of secondary importance. At the same time, the plans omitted many programs that OMB had previously identified as having a high impact on the public. Agencies did not list among their essential functions 20 of the 38 high-impact programs that had been previously identified. For example, one department included provide speeches and articles for the secretary and deputy secretary among its essential functions, but did not include nine of ten high-impact programs. In addition, although many agency functions rely on the availability of resources or functions controlled by another organization, more than three-fourths of the plans did not fully identify such dependencies. Third, none of the agencies provided documentation sufficient to show that they were complying with all aspects of FEMA's guidance. In our view, a number of factors contributed to these government-wide shortcomings. FEMA's planning guidance does not provide specific criteria for identifying essential functions, nor does it address interdependencies. In addition, while FEMA conducted an assessment of agency compliance with the guidance in 1999, it has not conducted oversight that is sufficiently regular and extensive to ensure that agencies correct deficiencies identified. Further in its assessment, FEMA did not include a review of essential functions. Finally, FEMA did not conduct tests or exercises to confirm that the identified essential functions were correct. In discussing our report, FEMA officials, while maintaining that the government is prepared for an emergency, acknowledged that improvements could be made. These officials told us that they plan to conduct a government-wide exercise next month, improve oversight by providing more detailed planning guidance, and develop a system to collect data from agencies on their readiness. However, these agencies have not yet determined how they will verify the agency reported data, assess the essential functions and interdependencies identified, or use the data to conduct regular oversight. In our report, we made several recommendations to address these shortcomings. In summary, Mr. Chairman, while most of the agencies reviewed had continuity of operation plans in place, those plans exhibited weaknesses in the form of widely varying determinations about what functions are essential and inconsistent compliance with guidance that defines a viable continuity of operations capability. Until these weaknesses are addressed, agencies are likely to continue to base their plans on ill-defined assumptions that may limit the utility of the resulting plans and, as a result, risk experiencing difficulties in delivering key services to citizens in the aftermath of an emergency. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my statement. I would be happy to any answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Linda, let me just start. Uh, bottom line is, are our agencies uh, uh, really prepared for the worst? Uh, agencies do not have plans at this point that are fully compliant with the requirements of FP65, and therefore I'd have to conclude that there is no assurance that they are prepared for an emergency. In fact, some of them are fairly woefully prepared. Right? That is correct. Um, the report that 19 agencies failed to identify their interdependence with other agencies mm -hmm. and how these interdependencies affect their essential functions. Uh, mm -hmm. Was GAO provided with an explanation as to why uh, these uh, agencies didn't identify their interdependence in their co-op plans? I don't. Excuse me. Um, I think part of the issue that my my staff is telling me that uh, it the requirement 
to identify inter interdependencies we think would be a good practice, but that requirement is not specifically outlined in FPC 65. So that is right. most likely the reason. You get the feeling some of these agencies are just checking the box. This is just another requirement that they've got to do. This isn't really, uh, uh, this isn't part of their mission, uh, but it's paperwork they've got to turn in. So it's kind of, they're not utilizing their resources. They're putting them toward other missions in the department. It's hard for me to comment on specific agencies' motivation for what they do, but we have to say that in some cases we saw what we thought looked like sort of a rote sort of template approach to the development of plans. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the difficulties is uh, both from the executive branch and the legislative branch, we put all of these different requirements on agencies, and it's hard for them to sort out what their priorities are. If they do them all, they'd never be able to get anything done, and so uh, as a result of that, um, uh, sometimes nothing gets done. Mm -hmm. One of the roles of this committee is to kind of highlight shortcomings in some mm -hmm. of these areas. This area, cybersecurity area, again, another one similar where agencies check boxes but mm -hmm. uh, don't really make this mission critical. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, they may be able to escape it. This is one of those issues that, uh, you know, hopefully we'll never see that kind of disaster and it'll never happen. Uh, but if it does and we're not prepared, of course, the results uh, uh, then uh, are, are worse uh, by an exponential uh, mm -hmm. amount. And if, um, if I ahead, could add, please. too, that um, uh, the fact that FEMA hasn't done the regular checking and oversight of the plans, I think that created part of the situation that you see today. If, if agencies realize that, that someone's going to be routinely looking at these plans, I think that would provide greater incentive for um, providing resources for this activity. Um, I, and there's no requirement, is there, that they uh, they send the plans to the, to Congress? They send them up through FEMA, right? No, sir. That might be something. I mean, we can get access to that that we look at to try mm -hmm. to underscore the importance of this. I mean, ho hopefully, again, this is something we'll, if you don't do it, it never happened, nobody will know mm -hmm. the difference. But if you have a, a disaster, well, there we are. Mm -hmm. uh, the report states that FEMA attributed its lack of oversight of these plans uh, in part to its limited number of personnel responsible for guidance. Now, as a result of your investigation, can GAO concur with FEMA that inadequate uh, personnel numbers uh, significantly affected uh, FEMA's ability to conduct oversight? We didn't specifically evaluate um, the numbers of staff that would be necessary for FEMA to conduct this, uh, this oversight um, activity. However, we do know that FEMA has, uh, since we completed our work, undertaken a rather large effort to get um, many more people involved. So this should not be a problem going forward. Okay. Thank you uh, very much. Ms. Watson. Uh, the chair asked a question about uh, if there was a requirement to report mm -hmm. to us, and uh, I'd like you to describe what you think uh, we should know in advance so that as we go about budgeting for whatever, mm -hmm. uh, there could be appropriate resources there to address what might occur. Uh, we really need to start looking ahead. We've had the shock of an experience that we will never forget now. Mm -hmm. How do we put, we're new at this, and I understand that. We were caught in a blind spot, unready. But what is it going to uh, mean in terms of resources to be ready? Uh, do you have a comment? Uh, uh Couple parts to that question. I think I, I think in terms of resources that, uh, according to the report we saw from OMB on combating terrorism that was published in September of 2003, apparently it's not unusual for agencies to spend several million dollars um, working on continuity of operations planning, and indeed the. Um, the president asked for over $100 million for this, um, this purpose in 2004. Um, I would have to follow up to tell you what was actually devoted, however. Uh, in, terms of reporting to, uh, in terms of reporting to Congress, I think that one of the things that um, Mr. Davis has asked us to do is to set a baseline of um, continuity of operations planning efforts which we have done with our first report, and in following up on that, um, hopefully uh, you'll be able to see the changes that take place over time and to be able to influence those changes further. 
Thank you very much. Gentlelady from Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you for taking the time to be here and visit with us today. You mention in your uh, report the Y2K efforts. Mm -hmm. And uh, my assumption, which I would like to know if it's correct or not, is that that is where you have drawn your baseline as working from the efforts that were made there in preparation for Y2K, that that helps with your baseline. Uh, what we drew from the Y2K effort was the previously identified list of 38 essential functions that were identified specifically uh, for, for that purpose. And we use this as an example against which to evaluate plans to see if these essential functions were present or not. Um, we don't need to imply that this, this is the definitive list of essential functions, but we felt it was one strong example of where the government had already identified um, programs that were, uh, had a high impact on, on the public. Okay, now, um, are, have you required the different agencies and departments to uh, going into those and looking at that Y2K planning and into those agencies and programs, have you required them to uh, go on and uh, give you the coordination with state and local agencies for implementation of continuing of services as it affects those departments? We haven't yet looked at the issue of uh, coordination between the federal and the, and the state and local governments. Okay. Uh, what is the status of the agency's information technology that is needed to oversee these essential functions? Well, one of the, um, one of the aspects of any kind of continuity planning would be to assure that your critical infrastructure and your systems would be available in, uh, in an emergency. And it, this would also extend to what we call vital records as well. Um, in order to operate an emergency situation, one has to have access to the information that is needed for dec decision making. Uh, so these are all aspects of uh, continuity of operations planning. What we saw among the agencies though, was frankly um, mixed preparedness in all these areas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Norton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for calling this hearing. It's an interesting hearing coming up today, especially since we have on the floor a continuity of operations. Uh, bill, uh, and I, I'm, I'm confused uh, even by the GAO report because all the dates I see go back to 1999. You speak uh, on the first page about uh, uh, assessments of agency compliance um, uh, conducted in 1999 and not, none conducted then. Um, now, and 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 I, again at page five. Uh, reference to July 1999 and the assessments uh, conducted um, should address any emergency or situation that could disrupt normal operations, including localized uh, emergencies. Well, I'm really wondering uh, whether anything that goes back to 1999 is relevant at all. That is to say, with the in in intervention of of September the 11th, I, 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 uh, I'm not sure what FEMA would be reviewing. If FEMA is reviewing um, plans that were set in motion in 1999, uh, when on page five of your own report you say uh, emerge, uh, it, it relates to any emergency, including localized emergencies, uh, I just wonder whether they don't need to start all over again, uh, whether any plan that was prepared um, before two, uh, the, the, the September the 11th is worth the paper is written on, whether or not we don't need fresh eyes when we look at what a local emergency is, whether we look at, when we look at infrastructure. Uh, uh, so I, I would like some, some, sense, some, some sense from you whether you think we can actually pick up from 1999 or whether we ought not step back uh, and essentially begin again. Uh, 
If I can clarify a little bit, the requirements first came into being for uh, the guidance first came into being in 1999, and agencies were required to have um, continuity of operations in plan in place at that point for that same year. It was also the same year that um, FEMA did an assessment of the plans and gave agencies feedback as to strengths and weaknesses. And I think o um, Oklahoma City may have occurred by that time. So I'm sure there was some sense that you could get a, a, a you know a, mm -hmm. a large emergency. But go mm -hmm. ahead. And um, so that was the first round of plans. But I wouldn't want to lead you to believe that none of those plans have been updated since 1999. Some some agencies have taken steps to revise their plans once or twice since then. But it varies quite a bit across the board. Uh, certainly, anything that went back to 1999 would need a significant reassessment before it could be brought up to date. And in, indeed, we found that. De you know, regardless of when the plan had been prepared, we found that most of them did not hit the majority of the requirements. And, you know, and in fact, we found not a single one that met all the requirements in, in, in their entirety. Uh, so all of them need a significant relook at this point. But I just wouldn't want you to believe that, that nothing has happened since then. Well, uh, well, obviously at the agency level, one would need to particularize uh, what the emergency planning was. I have no confidence that you begin by saying, hey, agencies, figure out what to do. I don't understand why there shouldn't be some overall. You talk, you talk in your report about the great disparities among these agencies. Much of that is to be expected. Mm -hmm. But without FEMA's guidance as to what constitutes a plan, what, what, more do, what else could, do, could you expect? So mm -hmm. I don't see how you, we can go back and criticize the agencies or even criticize FEMA mm -hmm. for not going back uh, agency by agency. Uh, my question is, why isn't there some general guidance as to what minimally a, 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 an agency uh, uh, should be doing, its plan should be, with the agencies f filling in the mm -hmm. particulars, rather than this kind of ground up approach and then us criticizing the agencies because somehow they are very different from agency to agency, as if that isn't exactly what you, th you should expect if you haven't given agencies uh, mm -hmm. some idea of, of what continuity of operation should be all about. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Chairman, I must say that I, that I, I appreciate your, your calling this hearing, but I, I think we're just going at it the entirely wrong way. To say to agencies all out there, hey, you all, come up with what you should be doing to continue your operations without some general guidance as to uh, these are the basics, now fill in, does not give me confidence, particularly here in the National Capital Region. Well, let me, let me uh, ask that, somebody. That, 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 that if there were an emergency, it could be handled. Yeah, Did an FPC 65 give out yes. the b basic uh, yes. guidance? Yes, FPC 65 um, uh, provides basic guidance on the eight elements of a viable coop um, capability. Isn't However, that also from 1999? Yes, that is from 1999. Well, and that I, is my problem. Mm -hmm. That I, is my problem. I think the world has changed since, two, to, since, since September 11, 2001, and that was before 1999. That was after 1999. So I think there's a more radical critique than the GAO report is what okay. I'm trying to say. Ms. Coons. I would just say that uh, one of the things that we point out, I think, quite strongly in our report is that, uh, that the identification of essential functions is a very critical first step in doing effective continuity planning. If you don't do that right, it probably doesn't matter what you do after that because you haven't figured out what it is you need to deliver in an emergency. Um, but we also point out that uh, the guidance to agencies, although they've issued general guidance, it was not specific enough to agencies for them to identify really what an essential function was and get any consistency across agencies. And that was compounded by the fact that FEMA was not doing the regular kind of checking and oversight to provide a, their expertise, to lend their expertise to the development of these plans, and provide their broad view of what was co going on government-wide. Uh, so I think our report does address some of the, uh, some of the issues that you're, you're identifying here. Well, thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you very much. Ms. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ms. Coons, for being here. You know, it seems to me that uh, if we had the technology in place for telecommuting, in the event of an attack here in Washington, for instance, uh, 
people, people could work at home. So I guess my question is, have any of the agencies, when you reviewed their plans, have they considered uh, or included te uh, telecommuting in their continuity of operation plans? That could certainly. Because that's been the hardest thing. We've been, mm -hmm. um, we've tried to get agencies to allow telecommuting in. That seems as hard as pulling teeth sometimes. Mm -hmm. And and uh, using, uh, you know, both the use of alternative facilities and the use of telecommuting could be a reasonable strategy to use in uh, in continuity of operation planning, depending on the kind of emergency that we're talking about. Well, if we had the agencies doing the allowing the telecommuting now, it would be in place, and then there would be an answer to some of the problems for some of these agencies. Uh, my other question, you know, I, I heard you say that if, it, you know, if, if FEMA or someone were doing, you know, reviews or what have you, mm -hmm. then these agencies might get on the, off the stick, I guess, mm -hmm. is what you meant. And that bothers me a little bit because are, are you saying then that our agencies don't do what we tell them to do unless they know we're going to check on them? But my, my real question to you, I mean, that was just a side note because it, it bothers me to, to hear that. But did agency personnel responsible for developing uh, the uh, continuity of operation plans indicate um, why they have not followed the guidelines that FEMA gave them? I mean, the, the person in each agency was responsible. Mm -hmm. Has, did they give you any feedback? Well, there's there's a couple different uh, couple different classes of things going on here. I think first, in some cases, the guidance isn't very clear. And so agencies maybe tried to implement it the best they could, but it was predictably then inconsistent across the government. So you have some of that going on. Um, in other cases, uh, I think agencies told us that uh, they had prepared their plan. It had been reviewed by FEMA in 1999. They thought the feedback they received was that the plan was all right. And frankly, I think they were surprised in some instances when we said, well, we don't think this meets actually the requirements um, or the guidance of FPC 65. Um, so there was a couple different kinds of things going on there. Sounds like a communication problem, Mr. Chairman. It seems like we have that a lot in the federal government. I don't know how we can fix that, but uh, thank you so yeah. much. And I would strongly suggest that we push the telecommuting <coughs> if we can. Great. I, I think Ms. Davis's idea on the telecommuting is something that uh, for agencies here uh, it, it, we need to do more of. I mean, this mm -hmm. committee will hold follow-up hearings on that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if an office gets devastated, people don't need to be in the office uh, in, in many cases to carry out their duties. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Van Hollen, no questions? Ms. Maloney, any questions? Thank you very much. This, was, this has been very helpful for us. We may have some follow-up pending some of the others, but we appreciate your oversight uh, on this and your analysis. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Proceed now to our second panel. Um, I want to thank Under Secretary uh, Michael Brown, the Honorable Michael Brown, the Under Secretary for Emergency Preparedness and Response Director from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security for being with us today. Um, is he? Hmm? Yeah, they're going to get him in here. Why don't we take a? Uh, we, we just uh, we can take a minute recess, but I'll, I'll wait for him to come in. There he is. There he is. Secretary, thank you for being with us. So why don't you stay? Uh, I'll swear you in. Our policy, uh, you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, and thank you very much uh, for being with us uh, today. Um, we'll have some lights in front of you in the panel. Uh, after four minutes, an orange light will come up, giving you a minute to make it five. If you if you feel you need to go over it, uh, we're not pressed for time. Uh, we'll do that, but your entire testimony is part of the record, uh, and our questions have been based on that. But thank you very much for being uh, and uh, being with us today, and thank you for the job you're doing. You have to make sure the microphone is the toughest part of the whole thing. I'm not used to coming in second. I guess you're just ready to go ahead and start then, right? Okay. Uh, good morning, Chairman Davis and members of the committee. My name is Michael D. Brown, and I am the Under Secretary of, for Emergency Preparedness and Response. Mr. Brown, let me department. just say, the reason we have you second is we have GAO first, and we give you the last word see, sure. when, they, when right. they come in and screw you. So right. it's really to your advantage to be uh, in that position. Great. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the Federal Emergency Management Agency's role in supporting the nation's continuity of operations planning and its program. 
FEMA was designated the lead agency for continuity of operations planning for the Federal Executive Branch by presidential guidance on October 21, 1998. Among other things, this guidance requires federal agencies to develop continuity of operations plans to support their essential functions. FEMA's leadership role is to provide guidance and assistance to the other federal departments and agencies in this important area. We have taken this responsibility very seriously and have worked hard to provide this guidance. As the program expert for the Federal Executive Branch COOP activities, FEMA and the Department of Homeland Security have made significant strides toward ensuring that COOP plans exist at all levels of departments and agencies. This effort entails our involvement with hundreds, if not thousands, of various COOP plans and close coordination with the General Services Administration. We have aggressively developed working relationships across the government to include the legislative and judicial branches to expand our efforts at providing advice and assistance to other federal departments and agencies in the COOP arena. We have established numerous interagency COOP working groups at the headquarters and at the regional levels. These working groups have opened communication channels across the government regarding COOP plans and programs and have helped organizations develop more detailed COOP planning in order to leverage capabilities and to improve interoperability. Moreover, we have developed new COOP testing, training, and exercise programs to help ensure that all departments and agencies are prepared to implement their COOP plans. Significantly, very significantly in fact, FEMA tested its own COOP plan and capabilities in December 03 by conducting exercise quiet strength. This headquarters COOP activation involved the notification and relocation, the notification and relocation of nearly 300 FEMA personnel on our emergency relocation group, and it successfully demonstrated our ability to perform FEMA's essential functions from an alternate site under emergency conditions. We are now leading the interagency exercise forward challenge scheduled for next month. This full-scale COOP exercise will require departments and agencies in the national capital region to relocate and operate from their alternate facilities. Some 45 departments and agencies plan to participate in Forward Challenge. A prerequisite for their participation is for each department and agency to develop their own internal Forward Challenge COOP exercise. As a result, there will be approximately 45 separate but linked COOP exercises conducted concurrently with the main Forward Challenge event. Because of these internal exercises, Forward Challenge preparation has cascaded across the country, with departments and agencies as far away as Fort Worth and Seattle participating. Our support for COOP exercises and training is not limited to the Washington, D.C. area. Working with the federal executive boards, FEMA has conducted interagency COOP exercises in Denver and Chicago, and additional exercises are scheduled in Kansas City on April 29th and in Houston on June 14th. To help facilitate this effort, FEMA has developed a generic interagency COOP exercise template that can be easily adapted for use in the field. Mr. Chairman, you have specifically asked me to address what steps FEMA is taking to address each of the executive agency's COOP plans and what steps we are taking to address deficiencies in those plans. Through our strong working relationships and through new and ongoing COOP initiatives, we are leading the government's COOP program to ensure improved coordination and provide enhanced planning guidance. FEMA established the Interagency COOP Working Group in the National Capital Region, comprised of 67 separate departments and agencies. This working group includes the Library of Congress, the GAO, the United States Senate, the DC Department of Transportation, the United States Court System, and the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. At the regional level, FEMA has used a phased approach to establish COOP working groups with many of the federal executive boards and federal executive associations across the country. In addition, we are revising the Federal Preparedness Circular for COOP. The goal is to have a single source document that all departments and agencies can refer to for their COOP programs. The new Federal Preparedness Circular incorporates many of the GAO's recent recommendations for improvements. It includes detailed information on how to identify essential functions and discusses the importance of interdependencies between departments and agencies. Mr. Chairman, the ability of the federal government to deliver essential government services 
in an emergency is of critical importance. In general, we agree that improved planning is needed to ensure the delivery of essential services. However, I unwaveringly believe the federal government is currently poised to provide those services in an emergency that requires the activation of COOP plans. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. I, just to start off, I was, I was pronouncing it uh, co-op plans. You're pronouncing it the COOP plans. And Coop. Coop. The reason I called it co-op is because chickens are in charge of the COOP. And I didn't want anyone in the administration to cry foul <laughs> at what I was doing, which is e exactly uh, what they do. Uh, I mean, obviously, we don't want yeah, I, I can't agencies. Compete. I can't compete with this. We don't want the agencies humor, so. to wing it uh, on their uh, coup plans. Uh, uh, so we're going to risk ruffling some feathers here today. Uh, <laughs> but I think it's fair to say the administration's proposals so far are nothing to crow about. Um, let me ask a few questions. Okay. <laughs> And, of course, I'm ready to fly the coup, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everybody acknowledges that the uh, first and most critical element of any uh, coup planning is the identification of uh, every essential function that an agency performs and will attempt to maintain in case of an emergency. But GAO reports that individual agencies' identification of essential functions really vary widely. Can you just kind of review in brief for us what steps FEMA has taken to assure that these critical functions are accurately carried out by every federal agency? Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. FEMA has a coordination role and provides guidance and assistance, but it is really up to the departments and agencies themselves to determine what's essential for their COOP plans. Uh, we do such things as have a monthly forum for, through the interagency COOP working group for the departments and agencies to address those issues and share best practices. I also believe that the revised preparedness circular that is soon to be released at the end of the fourth quarter will provide better decision-making guidance to the departments and agencies that will also ensure consistency uh, across the federal government. Moreover, through a readiness reporting system that FEMA is now implementing, we will be in a better position to provide more accurate and timely information regarding each department agency's COOP activities. But I believe it's important to note, uh, particularly important to note, that for the first time ever, as I said in my oral statement, FEMA exercised its headquarters COOP plan. It involved an actual notification and an actual deployment of our emergency relocation group uh, to our alternate uh, facility. This is the first time ever that FEMA has uh, done that and that we will now oversee for the first time ever a federal government-wide COOP exercise that will allow us to establish a baseline for future exercises that we continue, that we want to have now on an annual basis. I guess when uh, I asked this question of the previous uh, uh, panel, um, are agencies prepared for the worst today? Or are we getting there? Uh, we're certainly getting there. And I, I, my, I, hesi my hesitation is not about preparedness. My hesitation, Mr. Chairman, is about what is the worst. Uh, because the worst uh, in, in my world, unfortunately, is, you know, the detonation, for example, of a nuclear device or a dirty bomb or a, a bioterrorist event, which will result in catastrophic casualties and a catastrophic disaster of proportions that uh, will overwhelm all of us. So I, that, that's the reason my hesitation. Yeah. I believe that every department agency has a very good, robust uh, coup plan in place that we just now need to fine tune. I mean, I just, the experience of this committee as we go through little, little emergencies that come across the city, for example, regionally, as we had Tractor Man, we had a guy in a tractor hold up traffic and tie up this city for three rush hours. And there was the, the planning that took, well, there was no planning. There was a, a division over really what the priorities were, were to make sure that the person escaped, uh, I mean, that he was, what well, wasn't injured and was brought, apprehended, that no one was injured. Nobody looked out for, and so some of this stuff gets very contradictory as you start to have to go down the path and decide what are the uh, priorities. Um, you can't anticipate any and all bad things that can happen. No, but I think, but I think based on the template that we've put together and the revision of the federal preparedness uh, circular, that we will be able to provide them with a template that allows them to respond right. to any, almost any kind of, well, of disaster. Uh, Mrs. Norton's concern in the previous panel was that we were dealing uh, with a circular from the executive that came, th was a 1999 circular before 9-11. Uh, 
Uh, on 9-11, I can tell you, we certainly weren't prepared on Capitol Hill. I, we didn't know who to call. We, I mean, we're, we're kind of irrelevant to the process, though. Uh, it, basically, I mean, we don't like to think of it that way, but the government went on fine. Everybody, people, the military does their job, the police do their job, other agencies kick in. It's a lot more important of what happens here. And uh, I guess my question is, as we look at different agencies, we see different levels of, of planning for this. That's not, um, uh, uh, that, that, that's not unusual. What you usually find is we put so many requirements on these different agencies, on, on uh, in, in secretariats and the like, that, that they have to sort it out and some take it more seriously than others. And in fact, some of them, uh, how they plan and uh, is going to be more important to the American people than others. Um, and so as you look over this, uh, in terms of your planning uh, and, and, and the checklists and everything else, uh, what are we doing to check on this? There was an uh, allegation uh, in a, a GAO that maybe you didn't have enough people to really implement this job. This is a cost, this is, an, uh, this is a contingency planning, so it may never happen. And some agency uh, leaders, I think, think, well, I don't have to do this because it'll never happen, and then I can put my resources somewhere else and accomplish something that everybody that I know will happen. I mean, what's your reaction to that? Uh, let me go, uh, three things I want to respond to, Mr. Chairman. First of all, uh, your comment about um, the ability of the federal uh, the ability of the executive branch to be able to to actually coop and respond in, the, in times of an emergency. The good news, I believe, out of this hearing should be that all of the major departments and agencies, in fact, all of the departments and agencies, have a coop plan in place that we have reviewed and we have looked at. Do those need to be fine tuned? Absolutely. Do we need to continue to improve those? Absolutely. But there is no place in the executive branch of the departments and agencies where there is the lack of a COOP plan. So that's the good news. Uh, the GAO is correct in that we have uh, been concerned about the staffing levels, but one of the priorities that I put in uh, becoming undersecretary was to increase uh, the staffing in our national security uh, office, coordination office, and we have increased the staff levels. Additionally, I, we have received incredible support uh, from President Bush and the administration, and in the 05 budget, there is a $12 million increase specifically for COOP activities. The other criticism, uh, one other criticism that came out of the GAO report, I wouldn't call it a criticism, but one of their observations, um, was that some of the COOP reports that came in really didn't talk about how they interact with other agencies, that they'd simply look at what they did, and it was almost like a checklist. Which, by the way, is not uncommon. I'm not trying to be overly critical here. I'm just trying to make sure that as we look forward, we can continue to improve. And that is exactly one of the things that we want to that we want to test and exercise forward challenge is not just their ability to pick up and move and go to their alternate sites, but how do they interact? How are the interdependencies? How is the interoperability of communications among the different Ds and As? And where can we improve on that? So you have you have identified exactly one of the areas that we intend to push in the exercise. And I would, I would just take this opportunity also to caution everyone about the exercise because it is my philosophy and it's one that I'm trying to push all the way through FEMA and the, and the entire department, is that we don't, exercise, we don't do exercises to make things look good. We do exercises to push the envelope to find out where the vulnerabilities are, to find out where the weaknesses are so that we can come back and improve upon them. So I fully expect after Exercise Forward Challenge for us to, the interagency working group to get back together and find places where interdependencies didn't exist, and we need to improve those. Well, That's the purpose of the exercise. Right. And, you, and you did provide information about Exercise Quiet Strength, which was FEMA's uh, December yes. 2003 uh, exercise to test its headquarters coup plan. Um, but that is an isolated exercise of one agency and in reality, of course, particularly with you all, uh, the, the, an actual emergency would involve government-wide functions. Are we, is, is there an effort to test some of that later on in the interaction of some of the agencies? There, there absolutely is. But before we can go out and uh, be a good leader and convince all the other departments and agencies to do this, we have to show that we're willing to do it too. Okay. And uh, since FEMA had never done this exercise, I was very pleased that we were able to pull it off and be as successful as we were. Okay. Thank you very much. Ms. Watson. Thank you uh, for being here and uh, helping us uh, get our, wrap our minds around how comprehensive this uh, emergency preparedness and the planning might be. Uh, I was just given 
a printout from the LA Times that uh, this is the third loss of power at the Los Angeles airport in 10 days. And uh, when you think about Los Angeles airport under the FAA being one of the major ports on the West Coast, it's very troubling to know that a bird can stand on a wire, spread his wings, make the connection, and out the whole airport and stall flights all the way nationally and internationally, third time in 10 days. Uh, my question is, in your uh, interagency efforts, is it the FAA then that would uh, be able to take a look at all of our airports? And uh, it seems to me that, uh, you know, I can't really understand how a bird could do this three times in 10 days and where our backup systems are. And I assume it wasn't the same bird. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that bird has been, uh, is toast. <laughs> right. But, um, you know, it just seems like this is a weak spot, a soft target for terrorists. And they can send a bird up, you know, and knock out the whole system. And this is one of our major uh, international ports. We're Pacific Rim. And I'm very concerned about whether it reaches over to the FAA and if the FAA will look at all of our airports. Because it seems to me on 9-11, it was the airport was the scene, the launching of a terrible disaster that we've never had before and we were not prepared for. So in looking at how we prepare, I think something like this should be a function of the FAA and I would hope that uh, Homeland Security would certainly uh, raise these issues and, and uh, see if we can motivate and activate FAA to take a look. Yes, ma'am. And I'll, I'll certainly pass that, that information Thank and you. Uh, the, And I'll give you a copy along. of this you'd like. Right. I'll pass it on to uh, Under Secretary Labuti of the Information Analysis and Infrastructure Protection Director of the Department uh, because they are they're undertaking a, a significant review of all the critical infrastructure in this country certainly. and how we can better protect those vulnerabilities. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Ms. Watson, thank you very much. Ms. Maloney, any questions? Mr. Brown, thank you very much for being here today. Uh, we look forward to continuing to work for you as we develop these COOP plans. I'll get my pronunciations right, and <laughs> we'll get you armed with some funds when you come back here. But right. uh, oh, we continue, you know, we'll look forward to working with you as we continue to develop these. Uh, I'll just ask one last question. Uh, there is some concern um, among members that uh, maybe we uh, having these plans given to this committee where we can oversee them when they when they come in as well. Do you have any objection that we don't have to do that legislatively necessarily? Uh, but as you get the plan, sharing them with us so we can just stay abreast of what's going on. We are the major oversight committee. We'll, on we'll, cer we'll certainly continue those discussions, Mr. Chairman, and see if there isn't some way that we can have you more uh, attuned to what we're we're doing uh, right. in terms of the planning and the process. Again, th th these uh, this may event. Uh, hopefully, this will be. We're talking about events that never happen. Right, that's right. We're talking about plans that never need to be implemented. That's right. But should they do that, uh, all eyes will be on what were we doing in Congress. I, uh, I, I, I would, uh, I could, I would be remiss if I didn't remind ourselves uh, that these coup plans really go beyond just terrorist events. Uh, we also prepared to coup the uh, executive executive branch during Hurricane Isabel. There are many natural hazards which right. will cause us to coup also, not just a terrorist event. Plus the tractor man, the, the, isolated, the tractor man. <laughs> isolated incidents. Right. And we had another guy on the bridge, just to just get this off my chest, it's, uh, who was having a bad day and held up traffic uh, uh, on the Woodrow Wilson Bridge right. and clogged traffic on the East Coast for five hours. Yes. And it took them five hours to figure out they talked him down instead of shooting him off with a beanbag, which is what they should have done right away. And uh, you, I mean, because you have to look at the the greater good in right. some of this. It wouldn't have killed him. It would have been on, you know, would have gotten wet. But we, we these kind of plans sometimes we don't think about till they occur. Right. And uh, now that we have this agency, we're expecting uh, all knowledge to, to rest with you all and solutions to rest and, with and you. And we, we take this very seriously and we'll do everything we can to continue to improve well, it. We, we think you're doing great. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, and we'll take a second and uh, move to our third witness. And we have John Kern.
from AT&T. He's the Network Continuity Director for AT&T. This is a real live company that has to deal with these kind of issues every day. This is part of their business is, de is dealing with uh, emergency contingencies in service. Uh, Mr. Kern, if you'd rise with me. It's a policy of this committee we swear in. Uh, you have and any supporting witnesses you have. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give would be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Great. Thanks. Please have a seat. Um, your total testimony is in the record. Um, and uh, if you could, we try to keep the opening statements to five minutes, but if you need to take a little longer, we're not in, in a hurry here. Uh, you'll have, after four minutes, an orange light will phase on. That gives you a minute to be hit. And then the red light goes on five minutes, but take what you need. Thank you for being with us. I, I think you can add a lot to uh, our uh, testimony today. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is John Kern. I'm the Network Continuity Director for AT&T. My team and I are responsible for business continuity, disaster recovery, and continuity of operations for our worldwide network infrastructure. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss with you today how AT&T has implemented our continuity of operations plan, and we'll suggest some recommendations how federal agencies can implement continuity plans of their own that kind of fall in line with some of the processes that we use. The chart that's being displayed right now is an example of, of our uh, network continuity and business continuity program, which is very similar to the COOP. Um, we understand how important the services we provide are to our customers, both the private sector and the federal government services like the government emergency telecommunications services. We spend a great deal of energy and commitment to making sure that they can operate under any circumstances. This is both for our physical network and for cyber issues like security, for example, we kind of at a basic level, firewalls, intrusion detection at a higher level, uh, cyber security where um, things are detected automatically and there's basic patterns that are looked for in the network so we can protect the, our services of our customers. The next one. At a physical level, we have a dedicated team of people that we've invested over $300 million in equipment to be able to operate our network continue our network under any circumstances. It's unique in our industry. We've had 12 years of experience and expertise in developing this as part of our, our continuity of operations plans. The next one. One of the important things that was discussed today is, is exercising. I, I agree with the, the former witness that any plan that isn't tested really isn't a viable plan, and the whole point of an exercise is to find areas to improve the plan, to understand what could be done better the next time, and how to make the continuity operations plan a viable, executable plan. Um, we realize it's a long process to do continuity of operations, business continuity. It took a substantial effort and discipline on our part to get this far uh, in the, with our plans and our, and our commitment. We've been working with the GSA to provide agencies with multiple suites of security services, and we look forward to continuing to work with the GSA and your committee to bring continuity of operations planning across the federal government. It's obvious that continuity of operations planning is hard work. It requires investment. There is a cost to do it. In some cases, though, there's a larger cost in not doing it. Not having a continuity of operations plan that you can execute could mean that for several days your agency or your enterprise isn't able to provide the basic service to your customers, your constituents. The government should consider leveraging capabilities that have already been implemented in the industry, leveraging off the expertise of, of AT&T. Um, the government business is very important, both to our, to our customers, to the constituents of the government, and we're basically here to help wherever we can with, the, with your continuity of operations plans anyway, leveraging existing technology expertise. We've had a lot of benefit from our relationship with the federal government various agencies, Department of Defense, FEMA, National Institute of Science and Technology for Standards. We're now kind of offering what we've leveraged into those continuity of operations plans to offer assistance to, to this chairman, to you, to you, Mr. Chairman, and the, and the committee, and to the federal government. Thank you very much. You get a lot of real-world experience in this, though, don't you? Every time there's a storm or, or something like that, uh, you have to deal with this, right? Yes, sir. I mean, my, my job, I'm an operations level person. You know, if there's a disaster, my team and I go out into the field and do whatever we need to do to make sure that our network continues to operate under any circumstances. We were uh, heavily involved with our uh, network recovery efforts after the World Trade Center. Um, one of the things I mentioned a little bit earlier was having the discipline of a plan, the, the commitment to execute the plan, and even having you know, the resiliency and reliability built in. But 
you also need some flexibility in your plans. A good example, we had never, and I don't know anybody that envisioned somebody crashing planes into the building the size of the World Trade Center or the subsequent shutdown of the nationwide air traffic control system. Our plans didn't, didn't call for that or didn't counter that, but the flexibility we built into our disaster recovery plans basically uh, assumed we'd have regional disruptions, hurricane going through South Florida might shut down several airports, a, a earthquake in the, the west might shut down a few airports. So we have our people and our equipment regionally deployed so we can respond from any place. After the World Trade Center, when the air traffic system shut down, it basically was a small inconvenience why we had people, you know, for this point, drive east to New York versus getting on a plane like we might normally do. You have a lot of redundancy in your system, don't you? Correct. We, I mean, one of the things we do is we believe is the kind of continuity by design, not just assuming what's going to happen in a disaster, but how do you build that reliability and resiliency into your, the network or the service or whatever infrastructure you need to provide your services for your customers or constituents. For example, just in providing power, I know we mentioned the power outage at LAX, for the AT&T's offices where we create the communications and basically hub the transport for our customers, we have three or four different levels of reliability around power. We have separate power feeds from separate substations, so hopefully the bird with uh, spreading its wings across one power line wouldn't impact the other power line. We have dedicated generators at each building, we have battery backup, and we have the ability to bring in portable generators if we need. So again, that kind of multiple layers of reliability and resiliency would say that a power outage would never be noticed by our customers because something that we've built into the process right. or built into the system. We don't have to recover from it. We've planned for it. We've built it into the network itself. Yeah, one of the reasons we got you here today is because you, you, um, you know how to do this business. You do it on a practical basis. You, you are culturally a lot different than gov government. Uh, gov you have a lot of real world experiences in this at AT&T, right? Every time there's a massive storm or something, who knows what other disaster. Uh, so government's dealing with theoretical exercises. You're dealing with real world experience. And uh, there's nothing beats experiences. You know, I used to say the difference uh, between, uh, uh, between education and experience is uh, education is when you read the fine print and experience is when you don't. Uh, in this particular case, uh, you, 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 know, you get your mistakes out early because you have a lot of experience with that. The government doesn't. So secondly is you're in a competitive atmosphere. If you, these are not theoretical uh, occurrences to you. These are occurrences that if they happen and you can't satisfy your customers, they can go to a competitor. In the government's case, they got nowhere else to go. So it makes you respond differently to the government. We're trying to take some of those competitive spirits that you have and, and trying to tell the government, you know, th this is why you operate differently. This is why you make it more of a priority uh, than government does. Uh, we try to do it in government sometimes, but, you know, these agency heads, uh, they have a lot of pressure on them to perform under a, a lot of different uh, regulatory obligations. And this is just one, and this is one that probably won't happen, uh, mm -hmm. at least on their watch. So you tend to push it aside to put your resources towards something that's a little more current and a little more mission critical. One of the things that we did to get past that, because in the early days of our program, we had you know, similar issues where the different organizational heads thought, well, I have more important things to do. This, this type of disaster will never, never impact us. So one thing that we set up that's part of the process I displayed earlier was kind of the governance structure, is what's the set of rules and standards around what every organization, in the case of the government, what every agency has to do. And then even probably most importantly, and one of the functions that we perform that would probably be, definitely be a good idea for the government is, in our case, it would be a business impact analysis. In the case of the government, it might be a, you know, operations impact analysis. Understand across the entire enterprise, across the entire government, what agencies are responsible working together to provide certain key services and functions to the constituents. And then how do you address continuity of operations based on those critical services, not just on an agency level. And the other piece that we've introduced over the 12 years that we've been doing this is an idea that this is part of a person's function, this is part of their job. And, and for us, for a private enterprise, it goes to the future funding they receive, it goes to their pay, future promotions, it's all part of, in a sense, how they're graded. And it's another important piece is a common report card. I mean, yeah. if you have checklists, it's one thing. The next layer down is probably look at what's the report card so you know that a, a level A from 
a grade A for one agency means the same as a grade A for another agency. And, and you do the exercises that the gentleman from FEMA mentioned that are across right. multiple agencies, again, kind of driven to a specific service, not just that, a grade That is agency. an excellent point. It kind of mystifies me when you have a great fail, intelligence failure or something in the government, nobody gets fired. You have it at AT&T and you, you have a lot of people uh, moving their jobs out. You know, we just react differently. And, uh, you know, I'm not arguing one's necessarily better than the other, but we could use a little more of, uh, I think, the AT&T culture and the private sector culture sometimes in government and staying ahead of the curve on some of these. But because we're not in a competitive mode, uh, we tend to be more reactive than proactive. And that's the same in terms of you talk about incentives. Uh, for your managers, uh, there, there's no incentive for getting this plan down and having a, a great contingency plan. They're going to care more about current operations and what are you doing currently. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, I mean, I think that's a, you, I think that's the point you're making. I think it's good. You also have to deal with a lot of changing technologies, don't you, in telecom at this point. The move to wireless, you have to work uh, instead of interagencies. You have to work with your competitors in some cases, don't you? Your sh line sharing and those kind of issues. How does that work? Correct. I mean, uh, the one issue is, you said we talked about change in technologies. In some cases, cha change in technologies presents a challenge. In some cases, it pres presents a new opportunity. If you look at the increase in wireless technology, in the past, if you had to go to a physical place to connect into the network to get your job done or to get your business accomplished, now you can accomplish it wirelessly. So in some cases, technology presents a challenge. But usually, in, in a lot of our cases, it just presents more of an opportunity. To, and for, in the case of government, there's just more opportunities to leverage what's already being developed out in the private industry to do a good coup plan. You know, if you imagine, you know, the great advent in you know 802.11, you know, kind of wireless lands and just, just wireless cellular voice technology, it allows you to set up your continuity of operations sites in places you might not have been able to get landlines to. Um, as far as the question around the cooperation, one of the things that we do. Th through the Department of Homeland Security, there's a national coordinating center. And that's the one place in the industry where we can work together in the, in the event of a real disaster or an event that would impact the network like the power outage last summer, where we can get together to coordinate our activities to make sure if there's any mutual aid that makes sense, where can we offer assistance where another carrier might not have a, a, uh, enough generators or enough manpower to get a certain task done. So as, you know, what, what places in the federal government offer that place of coordination and command and control that, that the telecommunications carriers get through the National Coordinating Center is, is you know, another question they could kind of bring to is that FEMA's role or not. Um, has anybody from the government come and asked you and say, what do you do for, for your coup planning? Uh, anybody consulted with you said, just geez, you guys have to go through this. You've been through a lot of uh, natural disasters and the like. Uh, personally, I've had dealings with several different agencies about their coup plans, either reviewing them, offering suggestions on um, things that could be done, or in some cases, a lot of cases, we'll receive uh, requests from government agencies to understand how the services that we provide is something like an ultra available, which is a, a way that we can distribute technology across a given metropolitan area to make sure that you don't have you know, a point-to-point -point facility that's going to impact your ability to operate your enterprise. This gives you kind of a ring of capability, a place where you can operate your service in different places. So we'll have uh, requests from agencies to provide technology or to provide capability that they can use in their coop. So we've kind of had all different, all different flavors. And I think uh, the most uh, agency I think we've dealt with the most on it is, has been the GSA, where, again, part of FTS 2001, there was a whole level of specific security applications that ranged uh, four different levels of security that agencies could use to implement security needs. The, we're also working with the GSA on FTS networks, which is kind of the next evolution of how do we build in just the security, but the resiliency and reliability. Each agency does not have the same need for the robustness, reliability, resiliency. How do you have a you know, four or five tier structure so that agencies can get the reliability that they need to buy the resiliency to allow them to operate their business without agencies that don't need that same level of resiliency having to sense pay for a service they're not really going to use. Good. Well, thank you very much. Ms. Watson? Uh, I want to sincerely thank you for being here, um, Mr. Brown. Mr. Kern, but thank Excuse you. Excuse me. Uh, Mr. Kern. Thank you. I would hope that your researchers could look towards the future. Everyone is saying, well, who would have thought an airplane would, you know, hit a building? Well, we heard it rumored around long before 
Now we know that it is a reality. We need to think towards the future with our technology. You know, we just put a uh, apparatus on Mars and they plan for it to go over rough surfaces and to pick things up and photograph certain things. And what I'm hearing that frustrates me is that we're not thinking progressively enough. I am very frustrated that we've had our third outage, as I mentioned, in 10 days. And why are we still depending on wires that go above the ground if a bird can light on them and knock out the whole airport? Are we thinking about the possibilities? And we don't want to play on words, as was raised uh, with the last panel. We want to really get people out ahead of these occurrences. And uh, I think you could be very helpful, AT&T, in saying to our agencies, look, we have a design here that might work so you won't have this to happen again. And then it's their responsibility to take a look and investigate. I would hope and, uh, that you, and I know the competition is high, but come out ahead of all the others with a way to avoid, and I think a power outage can be avoided mm -hmm. if we think more progressively and more scientifically. Maybe we would, ought to contact NASA, because apparently they have planned for all contingencies when they put a spacecraft up. But I just want to encourage you to impact on us in government. And I think the chair was absolutely right. You know, uh, we don't have the experience. And uh, we don't get into the business of detecting things before they happen. We have not been in the business of doing that. We can make policy afterwards. But I do think we're going to have to go out to the utilities, go out to private industry, and say, help, and present to us, to FEMA, to the COOP or co-op or whatever you want to call it. You know, these are some things that government ought to invest in. And so I want to thank you for coming, Mr. Kern, and just Put that I really don't have a question. I, it's more or less, you know, a recommendation to you to come back to us. And Ms. Watson, let me just say to stay, stick with the puns, but to keep them on subject and the birds and the wires is, you can't do this on the cheap. Would be my. Okay. <laughs> That's very good. Very good. Yeah. yeah, you can't do it on the cheap. I was gonna, you know, in my opening remarks, mentioned in my extra kind of uh, capacity in, in my. I have seven acres in New Jersey. I have about nine hens and a rooster, so I'm familiar with coops both at a business level and kind of a personal <laughs> level. But it didn't seem right. But now that you're going you know, to throw cheap into the into the bargain, you know, maybe. But you know, definitely, you know, we've we're definitely willing to assist the government wherever we can. You know, we have over the hundred years that we've been around as an enterprise. AT and T has developed a very comprehensive set of standards around things like physical infrastructure. How do you power? an enterprise is important to you. How do you back that power up? What do you do around cybersecurity, physical security? How do you have continuity of operations plans that really take into effect, you know, where you can bring your people to, what kind of work they're going to need to do, you know, the impacts of things like telecommuting. You know, all those things, you know, we have a great expertise at and we're definitely willing to help the government wherever we can, either through our technology, our standards, our expertise, or just our, the experience that we've, that we've really developed over, in some cases, the last 12 years for business continuity, but in other cases, 100 years in operating a rather large infrastructure, a rather critical infrastructure that provides the network service that everybody relies on. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I can just take one more minute. Uh, we're going to have a bill on the floor, the Sensa, Sensa Brenner bill. And, uh, in reading the fine print, you know, this is where policymakers come in. You know, we read the fine print. We don't go on our experience. And it says that uh, if there is an extraordinary circumstance and the Speaker of the House of Representatives announces vacancies, well, if the plane had succeeded in hitting the Capitol, it might have wiped everyone out, including the Speaker. So if we're going to put law in the books, and make a policy, we're going to have to think beyond the words here. So it should be a, a designate, someone who has been, and who does the designating? Because the speaker and all the rest of us will probably perish if that would occur. 
And so my point I'm making is that we have to think differently than we have in the past. And as a policy maker, this becomes the law, you know, and it can be adjudicated in the court. So how do we think in a way that will address these unusual circumstances? And those of you out in the field, in terms of uh, the way agencies work and operations work and utilities work and so on, have to benefit, we have to benefit from your experience. And you have to suggest to us, now whether we make policy based on the input is left up to us. But I really invite your recommendations. And with that, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Watson, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Rufusberger, you have any questions? Yeah, I uh, didn't hear your testimony. Thank you for being here. Uh, just generally, though, we, in the event that there is a, a catastrophe or whatever it is, it seems to me that in your field that communications is an essential function. Uh, during uh, an event, after an event, and then, and then the months that, that, uh, after the actual event. Um, <clears throat> Do you communicate or work closely with anyone in Homeland Security as yeah. far as developing it? And, and as much as you can, what is that communication? Are, are they giving you the, the lead or are, are you helping them as consultants? Um, how would you describe where that is now? And again, we know Homeland Security is, is new. Uh, and, and what would you like to see to make that function even better? Uh, the one uh, we have, you know, many roles with the Department of Homeland Security. One of um, probably important to me is that National Coordinating Center. It's the part of Department of Homeland Security where the carriers all have a common meeting ground to both plan around continuity and also to respond to an event. I mean, during the World Trade Center, we worked through the NCC. Even at the point at that time, was part of the FCC to understand, you know, where we needed to bring in equipment or where we needed to have people. So. The, the, the key function of Department of Homeland Security for us is that kind of coordination role. Another one is if we consider what we try to do is not, in a sense, wait for the disaster, but how do you get out ahead and be proactive around looking at the events are, that are coming up that you might need to worry about the impacts on your network or your people. And, and I look at national security events as a big concern when one is declared by the government understanding what's the real risk, what's the impact possibly to our network, that we need to do something different ahead of time to you know, further harden our network, to bring in additional people in, in the nearby area. So that's one area where Department of Homeland Security, I know, has taken definitely takes the lead is around coordinating, around the contingency of planning for national special security events, and we work through them as part of that national coordinating center. Are you coordinating your networks for uh, using your own money? Do you use federal money? Where are where are you as it relates to money? Um, well, right now, any of the planning that we do, any contingency planning that we do, it's, it's, our, it's our own money. As far as I know, there, there's, we have not received any grants or funding to do our disaster recovery work or to do any of the contingency work we do. So it's something that we've determined is important to our customers, to the services we provide, and our ability to operate them under any event. We, we've decided to undertake, the, in a sense, the expense or the risk of doing that. That's, that's to my knowledge, there's no funding to do If an government. event occurs, say another major event in a major metropolitan area, are you ready? Yes. And with, since we have had our program for the last 12 years, you know, we, have, we were prepared for 9-11, not for that type of event, but based on the structure and the contingencies we had in place, we were able to respond and deploy equipment to meet the needs from that disaster. Since 9-11, we've increased our capabilities, we've added more people to the process, and we're, we're looking at things, some of the, the risks that are out there maybe have a higher probability now, the more man-made chemical biological attacks. You know, we're participating in top off three, which is the WMD exercise is going to be held in the New Jersey, Connecticut area next year. And it's just, you know, kind of new threats. So we've increased our capabilities to be able to respond to those new threats. So if there is an event in this country, you know, we're, we're prepared to respond to it. How about with your, your other major competitors? Are they in the same position you're in, based on your knowledge? Uh, I know you're going to say you're the best, but now after that, are they close? Uh, I'll say that, you know, we don't spend any money, you know, looking to see what our competitors are doing. We'd rather invest our money in technology. But I'm and talking more from a national security point of view in the event that there is a catastrophe and that are we able to provide the communication that's needed because you're not the only game in town. 
that, and unfortunately, that question would be best left to the competitors, but I would say that none of our competitors have the mobile recovery capability that we've developed, the resiliency that we've developed, the multiple layers of backups that we've developed. To my knowledge, none of our competitors have, have taken their services as seriously as we have and do not have that type of capability. We've invested more than $300 million. We have 150 pieces of mobile disaster recovery equipment dedicated to AT&T's network, the, the network that we use to provide services to our customers, both private enterprise and the federal government. To my knowledge, I've been, I've been in the telecommunication industry for more than 28 years and I've been in the disaster recovery field for more than seven years and none of our competitors have a mobile recovery capability that could to the extent that we do and again could not respond in the same fashion that we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank members for attending. Uh, thank our panelists. Uh, Mr. Kern, thank you very much. This thank has you. been very, very helpful to us and uh, wish you uh, luck in your future endeavors to well, uh, as well. Uh, again, I want to thank our witnesses for attending. I would like to add that the record will be kept open for two weeks to allow witnesses to include any other information uh, in the record. Hearings adjourned. On today's Washington Journal, Midge Dechter on her new book, Rumsfeld, A Personal Portrait, and Sidney Shanberg from The Village Voice talks about Iraq and the war on terrorism. Washington Journal, every morning at 7 Eastern on C-SPAN.